from MTN News. This is Face the State. Thanks for joining us on Face the State. I'm Jackie Coffin. And I'm Augusta McDonald. Jackie, we're just three weeks into the legislative session and committees are in the full swing of bill hearings, including proposals that are making waves. Yeah, Augusta, let's check in quickly with where we are on the calendar of the session. The session runs for 90 working days. And even though it's really just started, the deadline for requesting general bills was Tuesday. And the deadline to request Revenue bills is coming up this next week. Already a staggering 4,500 bill draft requests have been filed with nearly 500 introduced and a couple hundred going through their first readings and hearings. One of those bills is Senate Bill 154, which is an effort to amend Montana's constitution to change the definition of privacy to not include abortion access. Yeah, before the uh, session even started, this type of legislation was expected as Republicans hold a supermajority. But amending Montana's constitution can only be done by voters. Let's check in with MTN senior political reporter Jonathan Ambarian to learn more about this bill. Senate Bill 154 is only two sentences long, but it got a lot of attention in Senate Judiciary Committee on Tuesday as it seeks to change the way Montana's Constitution is interpreted when it comes to abortion. The premise is courts make mistakes. They're human. They make mistakes, get more information. SB 154, sponsored by Senator Keith Regeer, a Republican from Kalispell, would state the right to individual privacy in the Montana Constitution can't be interpreted to create a right to abortion or government funding of abortion. In 1999, the Montana Supreme Court ruled in Armstrong v. State that that constitutional provision does give women the right to an abortion before fetal viability. That decision's been used to limit what restrictions the legislature can place on abortion. Regeer argued abortion shouldn't fall under individual privacy privacy because it affects both a mother and an unborn child. The framers of our Constitution could have left out the word individual, but they obviously felt that was important. On Tuesday, supporters of the bill said the overturning of Roe v. Wade last year created a different legal environment, and the Montana Supreme Court's decision wasn't the final word on the issue. You as our elected state representatives, deciding the question of whether Montana's right of privacy encompasses a right to abortion is entirely appropriate and within your purview. Governor Greg Gianforte and Attorney General Austin Knudsen have already called on the court to reconsider the Armstrong decision. Opponents of SB 154 said applying privacy rights to abortion was appropriate. Decisions about our bodies, our health care, and our families are the most private decisions we make. It is into that realm that decisions about pregnancy and abortion fall. They also argued the bill overstepped the legislature's authority, and it was the court's role to interpret the Constitution. All this bill is going to do is create a challenge that is going to succeed because you don't have the authority to pass this bill. Regeer told MTN he acknowledged the bill would likely be challenged in court if it passes, but he believes it's an issue that's worth revisiting in the judicial system. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Thanks, Jonathan. One of the biggest issues facing Montanans is housing. 89 bill draft requests related to housing have been filed this session, and a couple of bills related to housing had hearings this week. On Tuesday, a bipartisan bill requiring application fees for rental units be completely or partially refunded if the applicant does not ultimately get to rent the unit was right up front in this in front of the house judiciary committee the example of bozeman was used and representative kelly cordham a democrat from bozeman says the level of demand means a hundred people may be paying to apply to the same unit with only one family ultimately selected while house bill 233 has bipartisan report opponents say it's taking money away from rental companies the house judiciary committee will have to take executive action on the bill for it to move beyond committee the House State Administration Committee heard arguments on a bill on Tuesday that would require any vote be open to public observation and continue without adjournment until it's completed. Representative Lynn Helgard, a Republican from Missoula, sponsored House Bill 196. The bill aims to reverse a 2019 law that allowed vote counting to be paused overnight and resume the next day. Representative Helgard says the goal of having votes counted in one sitting and open to public observation is to increase faith in the state elections. All we're asking is that we go back to the protocols that were in place in 2019. Um, and since this language was removed, the voters um, having the integrity and security of our elections has eroded 
I ask a due pass in an effort to start restoring voter trust. Dana Corson, elections director for the Montana Secretary of State's office, spoke in support of the bill, saying if passed, it could get election results faster. However, election officials in Gallatin and Flathead counties, as well as the legislative chair for the Montana Association of Clerk and Recorders, spoke in opposition of the bill, citing staffing shortages, the possibility of working for potentially days at a time, and the inability to start early counting due to the bill's language. We used to do the count without ceasing. Um, I can tell you sometimes we worked 30 to 40 hours without a break, without sleep, um, and that was for elections that there weren't even any concerns with. You want folks as prepared and as rested as possible to count all of those under all of the protections that are in place. If this bill were to go through, uh, that early counting the day before the election would not be able to happen. And therefore, we probably won't get results until Wednesday or Thursday. Further discussion on how House Bill 196 could be logistically enforced or amended is to be expected following Tuesday's committee hearing. The committee did not make a decision on whether to advance the bill on Tuesday morning. In Helena at the state capitol, Sam Hoyle, MTN News. Highways are the lifeblood of many Montana communities, often going right through the middle of town bringing travelers and tourists. MTN's John Riley takes a closer look at proposed legislation that would give local municipalities control over highway sidewalk permitting and city limits and meet with an impacted business. This is Broadway Street in Townsend, Montana. Just about as textbook definition as you can get for what main streets look like in small towns in America. However, this is also Highway 12, which means it's under the jurisdiction of the Montana Department of Transportation. The roadway parking and sidewalks are all under MDT on the highways. That jurisdiction management has been causing issues for some Montana businesses. I believe this is a situation where good intentions have kind of run amok, uh, some unforeseen consequences to uh, the laws. House Bill 198 would change that, giving control of the sidewalks to local municipalities. Townsend Hardware owner J.B. Howick says he would like to put displays out on sidewalks to help entice customers to come in, but has been denied by MDT in the past. Howick admits his first year owning the business, he went too far with some potted plant displays, but since then has been denied things like displays right next to the business. Uh, as a result, items that are on sidewalks, that are above sidewalks, that encroach into sidewalks, they feel that's their jurisdiction and they just assume none of them were there. Businesses MTN spoke with said they were told by MDT their signs and other items were in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. According to the MDT website, the state requirement for minimum clearance is 60 inches. However, ADA does allow for 36 inches of clearance as long as there is a 60 inch by 60 inch passing spaces at intervals of 200 feet. The bill sponsor, Julie Dooling, says no matter what, any law passed by the legislature has to follow federal ADA. One of the main points of this bill is we still have to be in compliance with ADA. It just gives the municipality a, um, discretion and authority to make their own ordinance regarding display of items on a sidewalk within, within the MDT right of way. Howick also noted it's just good business to make sure everyone, no matter their mobility, has access to his business and would never want to block that access. That's undermining my own, my own customer base. I want them to come into the store. Uh, frankly, it's a little bit hard enough as it is dealing with a 100-year-old store that was never originally designed for disability access to block the sidewalk. That would just be mean. MDT opposed a similar bill last legislative session. We reached out to the department for comment on the proposed bill, but our requests were not returned. In Townsend, John Riley, MTN News. At a hearing Tuesday before the House Local Government Committee, the Montana League of Cities and Towns and the Montana Chamber of Commerce through their support behind this legislation. No one testified against the bill. A representative from MDT did testify the bill contained sufficient language to protect the state. We'll continue to follow that. Yes, we will, Augusta. And after the break, we continue the conversation on housing with stakeholders in the hot seat. And I sit down with policy experts to break down the budget as Face the State continues. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome you guys back to Face the State. Uh, this week we're talking about housing. And we have Representative Kim Abbott from Helena and Representative Kelly Cordon from Bozeman here to talk about that, each carrying some interesting housing bills this session. 
Um, and Kim, I'll kick it off with you because we just saw a new housing bill introduced today that we got a draft of your Montana Housing Fund um, bill. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, thanks for having us, Jackie. Always fun. Um, so, and thanks for covering housing. Like we think that there's a serious housing crisis and it needs attention. Um, yeah, so I think what we've heard, Kelly and I both, um, and all the members of our caucus, when we're talking to voters, when we're talking to small businesses, when we're talking to municipalities, um, is that we have a serious housing crisis. And part of that crisis is that we don't have enough supply. Um, for the demand in housing. And so when you look at, um, and Kelly has a really great consumer protection bill, um, my bill is more about trying to increase supply. Um, so it's looking at the fact that we need capital in communities to build um, and understanding that we need public private partnerships um, in order to achieve that goal. And what I'm proposing is a workforce housing trust fund. Um, so long-term um, funding for projects, um, municipalities, private developers, and nonprofits could all apply. Um, nonprofits could apply for grants, municipalities and developers could apply for a revolving loan. Um, so no interest loan um, to build housing in communities that is guaranteed to be affordable whether we're building properties or whether we're building um, homes that people buy, uh, we're looking at the um, average median income in those communities and we're guaranteeing that it's affordable housing. And that's really important to us. So we're, we're excited to have the conversation. We think the 500 million into this trust really meets the scale of the crisis um, from this angle, which is building supply. But also we understand that we need a multi-pronged approach with multiple strategies on this. And, and that's where, you know, um, Kelly's bill is critical to um, in the short term, I think. And so I'll pivot right to that to Kelly. Tell me a little bit about your bill. We just heard a hearing of it this last week um, in front of House Judiciary. Um, the premise of your bill is refunding rental fees partially or fully to people who do not ultimately get a rental approved for a rental um from bozeman why is something like that necessary and what is encouraging you to bring forward this bill this session thanks jackie and thanks for having us um we've seen an unprecedented de demand to live in montana um we have a whole bunch of new people coming in from out of state we have um our economy is doing well tourism is is bringing in more people every day and there is just not um there there Everybody wants to get an apartment in Bozeman right now. And what that means is uh, you might apply for 10 places and get none of them. And all 10 of those may, might charge you between 20 and $100 um, to apply. And then at the end of that, you are short that money. And that could be half a month's rent. Um, when you're just trying to either go to college or move in the area for a high paying job or something like that, it's, um, it's unfair. It's uh, these big property management companies are harvesting these fees because they could get 50 applications and the fourth one's accepted. And that means they get 46 application fees in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And after a couple times of that, uh, a lot of these folks give up and we lose a member of the community. We lose potential workforce. Um, it's uh, a tough problem right now. And I heard a lot of, about it from constituents uh, this summer. So as we're talking about the conversation of housing, uh, you know, the governor had convened a housing task force, appointed a, a housing task force, and some of the recommendations we ultimately saw coming out of that were aimed at um, deregulating or cleaning up some of the regulations, encouraging uh, maybe a building boom um, with the idea that that's going to be what drives costs down. Um, are there enough protections for renters, low affordable or affordable income, excuse me, affordable housing options? Um, was that represented enough? Do we need to see more of that? Is that why we're seeing some of the bills this session carried by Democrats that look at renters and low income housing? 
Yeah, so I think the the Governor's Housing Task Force um, produced some recommendations that we can definitely agree with, um, whether it's ADUs by right, you know, um, or um, getting rid of some burdensome regulations around manufactured homes, you know, like we, we definitely can um, eliminating duplicative permitting, you know, for two agencies like we, we can um, definitely support, you know, making things more efficient. Um, I do think that what the governor's recommendations um, are missing are two things. One, understanding that we need a direct spend on build like we like we need to fund building supply and to the guarantees of affordability aren't there um and they don't happen by themselves um we've seen that so we think those are the two things that are missing and and i don't know if kelly has um he he comes from a community that um has a very very hot rental market um so i don't know if you have something to add on that kelly uh, I, I want to agree with you on those guarantees that this is affordable. Um, my district has doubled in size in 10 years. Uh, there's just not enough housing going up. And if uh, if uh, state work on this plan doesn't produce those affordable homes and just makes multi-million dollar homes out there for, for out-of-state retirees to buy, that's not going to help the supply at all and not help Montanans live in Bozeman and keep our, our businesses with employees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the problem will just get worse. And kind of wrapping up this conversation, looking at these bills, what are some of the barriers in getting them passed? Well, I think um, there's a lot of competition for how we invest in ourselves going forward. We have a generational opportunity to invest in our future in the state of Montana um, with the surplus. And there are a lot of competing ideas that we think are good. You know, um, and we need to figure out how to work with um, with each other and with um, you know our colleagues across the aisle and with the governor's office to figure out um, you know what the best investments are. I think there's a lot of um, acknowledgement that housing, childcare, and property tax relief um, are important, and you have a lot of different proposals on those. Although we haven't seen much from Republicans on childcare yet, um, but um, you know, our we had our first hearing. Um, Representative Howell from Missoula um, had our first hearing on child care. These are workforce issues. These are economic issues for for Montana. Um, and you know, the biggest barrier is that we need fifty one twenty six and one. You know, to get one of our proposals across the finish line. That's hard work. Kelly's working on it now with his bill. Um, I'll be working on it with mine, and we're going to have to compromise. We recognize that, but we want to deliver for our communities. We want to put, you know, Montana taxpayer dollars to work for Montanans and make sure that our economy is working for working folks, middle class folks. Um, Kelly, any closing thoughts? I would like to reiterate something Kim said, and that is focusing on solutions that will help us long term. We need long term investments, not not little band aids right now um, and it, when we start thinking about where our community needs to be in four years or eight years um, we can focus those funds in a much more responsible way we'll keep tracking them and see where this all goes um this will not be the only conversation we have about housing on face the state it's one of the biggest issues facing montanans right now so we'd love to have you guys back in the future anytime you're welcome and we'll follow some housing bills. And if anyone wants to weigh in on the conversation, just let us know. We're here. All right. And I'll thank you both for being here tonight. Thanks, Jackie. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome to Face the State. I have with me Rose Bender from the Montana Budget and Policy Center. She's the research director. And what the center does is kind of evaluate the way that lawmakers are creating policy and look at the numbers um, behind uh, what, what different um, bills will cost and kind of analyze their effectiveness. So thank you, Rose, for being with me today. Thank you. We've been following um, the governor's income tax cut bill, Senate Bill 121, which um, is a sustained long-term loss of revenue. It reduces our top income tax rate from 6.5% to 5.9%. And that um, it also increases our earned income tax credit to 10% of the federal from where it is today at 3%. Um, 
While bolstering the earned income tax credit is an important step to supporting families living on low wages, it's worth considering the cost of each component of the governor's proposal. Um, this cut, um, the vast majority of, majority of it will go to the wealthiest Montanans. Those, because of the rate reduction, those earning the top 1% of Montanans, those earning over $572,000 a year will get almost $6,000 on average each year, while those with lower incomes, middle income families, those near the median um, between like 43 and um, $67,000 annually will receive on average $50 or less than 1% of that. Um, those at lower incomes may see an earned income tax credit increase, but at most that'd be a few hundred dollars. So um, we're concerned, I guess, about the, the increase in tax cuts for the wealthy. And um, revenues may be high today, but a lot of that is one-time revenue from federal stimulus and inflation. And this bill cuts our tax base in the long run. So uh, fast forward, when we're not having such a stimulated economy, um, we're concerned to we're concerned about what the effect will be on um, what the state is able to do to invest in our their citizens. How significant do you think that long term implication is? Um, I mean, I guess when would you start seeing that tax cut, um, that uh, top tax bracket reduction come into play in terms of maybe state departments um, having smaller budgets? I guess when do you start to see that play out? That's a really good question. And I think, um, like any economist might say, I mean, it depends. But we know the fiscal note shows this this tax cut costing upwards of up to 180 million adult 180 million dollars a year once it's fully phased in. Um, that is a huge amount of our revenue. Additionally, um, this bill is cutting tax rates that I'm going to pause here for a second because it's a little bit wonky. But last session there were two big income tax cut bills passed. Senate Bill 159, which just cut our income tax rate, and then Senate Bill 399, which will go into effect in 2024. That bill changed our tax base to more closely align us with the federal government. And from there, reduced the tax rate to 6.5%. There are some unknowns and uncertainty when you switch over to a new tax base. So this bill is cutting tax rates on a tax base that hasn't even gone into effect yet. In 2003, the legislature significantly cut income taxes and um, estimated that those income tax cuts were going to cost about 26 million a year. They ended up costing 100 million a year. So there is some uncertainty when you're making big tax changes, and it would behoove Montanans to just slow down a little bit and see what the effects of Senate Bill 399 are before we cut tax rates further. So what sorts of um, bills are you watching that you feel more, um, I guess, that that the center kind of likes what they do? I guess, where are you seeing legislation that makes a difference for um, for renters, for low income families, for 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 kids, some of the populations that you are kind of looking out for? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, this week we saw, well, we would like to see if we're looking at tax reform to see some investments in Montana families, those experiencing high costs in housing, childcare, um, those, ex those working on low wages. Senate Bill 15 was heard today in Senate Taxation Committee. This is a bill that came out of the Legislative Revenue Interim Committee. It was passed out of that committee on a bipartisan vote. It will um, essentially create a tax credit that is very targeted to homeowners and renters experiencing high property tax costs as a percentage of their income. Uh, property tax in Montana and most places is regressive um, because it's not tied to income levels. So um, people living on very low incomes pay high percentages of property taxes as a percentage of their income compared to other people. Wealthy people pay a lot lower percentage of property tax. Um, this bill would be able to reduce the effective property tax rate for the lowest income 10% of Montanans from nearly 9% to under 5 So basically cut it in half. 
um, significantly increasing the fairness of our tax system. That's one. We'd also like to see um, investment in a child tax credit. Uh, the governor does, governor does have a proposal um, for that, which we're happy to see. And then also um, one way to get at uh, wages, increasing wages for low wage earners is to invest further in our earned income tax credit, um, which was a component of the governor's income tax cut bill, but um, it was a very, very small piece of a overall tax cut that is regressive and goes to wealthy families. Okay. Rose Bender, uh, Research Director at Montana Budget and Policy Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome back everyone to Face the State. With us now, MTN senior political reporter, Jonathan Ambarian, with what we can expect next week at the legislature. Jonathan, what, what are you looking forward to? Well, thanks Augusta. Yeah, um, next week, the uh, big topic of discussion is gonna be Governor Gianforte's State of the State Address, which uh, comes at this about this time uh, every session. The governor lays out his plans uh, for the next two years. I imagine that we'll hear him talk a lot about the state economy and a lot about his, uh, proposals to cut a bunch of state red tape and probably a lot about his uh, proposals for tax relief. And those proposals, uh, some of those have started getting hearings and they're now making their way through the house, the first uh, chamber, but there's going to be some discussions budget wise about possible changes to those. So I expect we'll see some of those uh, type of discussions in budget meetings next week. And of course, uh, the broader discussions of the state budget are continuing as well. Uh, and I've been told that uh, some of the subcommittees are getting close to wrapping up their, their initial work and we could start to see um, the first budget action coming in the next week or so. I think that a lot of the, the discussions now are, are less about the actual, like what they do and, and more sort of the, the technical mechanisms of it, like on the tax things, for example, just how much money should be given back is property tax rebates, should there be income tax rebates, broader income tax cuts. So everyone has sort of a different opinion on it. And uh, the, the tricky thing in the budget discussions is always to get everything uh, boiled down into one pro, uh, one broader program that everyone can get on board with. And that's, that's why it takes uh, usually right up until the end of the session. Okay, again, MTN senior political reporter, Jonathan Ambarian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Augusta.